Right, okie dokie. So, um, a couple of last kind of miscellaneous bits um, that we didn't quite get a chance to do in class. This is what I would have done um, earlier in the week. Um, but I've kind of moved stuff around because I'm not going to be in on Wednesday. So, um, I will put this sheet up on Teams as well. Um, or you can just find the bits in your book. Um, the page references are down on here. We want to have a look at the depictions of masculinity to go with kind of those depictions of femininity. We want to have a brief look at the kind of educational conflicts that are present in the narrative. And we want to have a quick look at the grooming. I'll split it down into three little videos um, just to make it a bit easier to kind of differentiate and watch. Um, and it's up to you how you do it, to be honest. The, in an ideal world, you'll pause at the various points that are relevant um, and kind of have a think about it yourself rather than just um, kind of listen to what I'm saying, but it's up to you, um, whichever makes you happy. Right, so we'll start with the masculinity stuff. So we've talked about feminism across both. If you think about the kind of comparison to the history boys, you can talk about the kind of the empowering depiction of Brody, how that matches with Miss Lintart. You can talk about the um, sort of more disempowering aspects of Brody and link that to the more disempowering aspects of Lintot and to kind of Fiona. Um, but what we haven't necessarily talked about as much is the kind of depictions of masculinity in the text. So there's a couple of kind of leading questions here. So out of the figures in the Primus Jean Brody, which of those two male figures is the more typically masculine? What makes him more stereotypically masculine? You want to think about the way in which, although there's one that's sort of more masculine than the other, how do both of them follow their more kind of typical masculinity? And then it's a primarily kind of female dominated text. So think about how that masculinity is also kind of undermined in various ways. The undermining of the masculinity is linked to kind of the empowerment of Brody. So if I was doing this in lesson, I would give you a few minutes to kind of think about those as prompt points and then have a, a brief discussion around. So it's worth just having a think on your own about the kind of the overall perspectives. Um, and pausing at this point and um, then kind of coming back in a minute once you've had a kind of think around. But again, up to you people. Right, okay. So, who is more stereotypically masculine? Well, let's start by kind of contextualising this in terms of comparison. If you think about the history, boys, you've got the more conventionally masculine figure of Dakin. You've got the far less masculine figure of Posner. And you've got the kind of dichotomy between the two, the kind of difference between the two that you can kind of draw out and discuss. In The Primus Jim Brody, you've got a similar kind of foil pairing dynamic. You've got Teddy Lloyd, who is the more conventionally masculine. He's gone off, he's fought in the war. Um, he's this more kind of masculine, better formed figure. You've also got Gordon Lowther, who's the other love interest, but his masculinity is, you know, compromised on multiple levels. Having said this, they do follow a number of traits of kind of typical masculinity. They are figures that can provide a kind of support basis for women. They are competitive in the ways of kind of conventional masculinity. They are also um, kind of objects of desire for Brody, something to pursue. And then you get this whole idea of kind of their masculinity undermined. Well, in their pursuit of Brody, both of them in many ways are the more subordinate figure, especially Gordon Lowther, whose masculinity is compromised kind of a great deal through that. So those kind of things would allow you to kind of form your lines of argument. You're thinking in a kind of 
comparative way. So maybe you're comparing kind of Postner to Lowther for the gender and sexuality question. Maybe you're looking at kind of ideas of typical masculinity, how they're depicted through the text, how they're depicted as the norm, um, comparing that across to kind of Dakin. Um, but that's the kind of opportunities you're looking for. You then need to kind of be able to kind of evidence it from the text, obviously. So again, I, my suggestion would be that rather than just wait for me to tell you, you have a look at the extracts that we've got here work out how Muriel Spark is actually depicting those things. Think about any kind of terminology that could come in and alongside to kind of go with it. Again, all of this is kind of practising for when you're looking at those unseen extracts and things like that, thinking about that kind of overall approach. You've got to be kind of just ready to be kind of flexible with it, essentially. So, pause me if you want to. Don't if you don't want to. Um challenge yourself essentially right so if we have a look at the first one this is a gordon lowther essentially kind of flirting with brody using the students as kind of a proxy in many ways so as a kind of a stand-in so there is a kind of typical aspect of masculinity this kind of use of the female in a kind of objectified form. He twitches um, the ringlets of one of the girls um, as a kind of provocative action. Um, it's a little bit creepy, but there we go. Um, but the more important bit is the kind of demeaning of his masculinity here as well. He's like a child showing off its tricks. So the simile becomes important in that he is submissive to Brody in this respect. She, like the adult in the, the analogy here. Um, and it's that kind of childlike need for validation from her as well. There's the idea that what he's doing, this kind of provoking her to a kind of flirtatious sexual behaviour is non-traditional as well. Um, this kind of idea, um, testing if Miss Brodie was willing to conspire in this sort of un-Edinburgh conduct. Edinburgh is seen in many ways as kind of a place of more traditional values. So um, that's kind of significant in this context. Um, you then get various bits that kind of depict Gordon Lowther. So alongside on the same page, he's small, he's got a long body and short legs. Um, his hair and moustache were kind of red gold. So the red gold kind of draws him together with Teddy Lloyd. They both have kind of similar coloured hair. Um, but in comparison to Teddy Lloyd, he's small. So physically, he goes against those kind of conventions of masculinity. The adjective is important there. You then get the juxtaposition between the long body and the short legs. So, again, there's something kind of unattractive around him as a kind of figure here. Um, there's something disproportional that's created in that juxtaposition. You then get this idea, both are already being able to act as rivals for her, her attention. Well, this is kind of both typical masculinity, this idea of rivalry, competition... Um, but it also places Brody in a sense, in a position of power. Her sexuality has given her a sense of power. And this idea of them kind of seeking her validation, her attention, um, suggests that they are, again, both competitive but also subordinated. We then got the more direct kind of comparison between the two. Now... The interesting thing here is around the kind of features of form as well. So remember, you need to talk about features of form. You have got this omniscient narrative voice that's able to enter into the minds of different characters. And here it's engaging with the perceptions of the girls, the way they respond to these two masculine figures, the way that they have, you know, their perceptions of attractiveness. So they look very similar like each other. 
Um, and then, as we said before, this kind of red gold draws them together. Remember, foil characters are similar in many respects, but then different in others. And Teddy Lloyd is then the better shape. So you get this kind of comparative element. He's the better featured. So you get, again, this comparative element is continued and more sophisticated. And you get the kind of mystique element. He's sort of half Welsh, half English. This idea of this kind of hoarse voice as if you had bronchitis. Again, the the kind of idea of the kind of deep-voiced masculinity that goes with Teddy Lloyd as opposed to the kind of small, long body, short legs of um, Gordon Lauder. Um, you then get the kind of superlative element as we kind of go through most wonderful of all he had only one arm the right um which he paint with which he painted the other was a sleeve tucked into his pocket he lost the contents of the sleeve in the great war now again in certain ways this compromises his masculinity it means that he's a kind of less imposing figure in many ways um with the only having one arm Having said that, it connects him to fighting in the Great War, something that Teddy Law uh, Gordon Lowther has not been able to do. He's kind of weaker physically. He's um, been kind of allowed to dodge national service, essentially. Um, it's also the kind of the idea of the artist. There's a kind of mystique around the artist, the creator, um, here, the kind of the originality of composition. So the idea of him as an artist is significant too. Um, we then get this kind of anecdote that Muriel Spark has in here. And within this anecdote, we're in the art lesson. We've got Gordon Lowther leading the lesson. And we see this kind of masculine control, but we also see the girls' responses to this masculine control. And it comes with a kind of a violence, with a threat. So it starts out with a kind of conditional, if you girls don't shut up, I'll smash this saucer on the floor. So the threat, the condition placed on it, um, and the certainty that kind of goes with it. You've got this modal construction, here's... Dialogue is shaped in a kind of threatening way. And then you get the, the actual violent response. He smashes the source to the floor. So faced with their inability to kind of stop laughing, he follows through on the threat. Um, he smashes the source to the floor. And it does create um, a kind of control in the classroom, the, the kind of dead silence that follows. Um, and his dialogue continues to reinforce this idea of kind of masculine control. You with the profile pick this up. And the implication here, it's imperative. It reduces Rose Stanley to simply her artistic quality um, and kind of directs her. Um, placing her in this kind of domestic role, cleaning up after the kind of male figure. Um, and then you get the kind of response of the girls going, this is where the narrative voice is important. You enter into the minds, you're able to see these kind of private conversations and things. So the girls looked anew at Rose Stanley's profile, marvelled at Mr Lloyd's style. Um, they kind of remarked to Sandy, so Jenny remarks to Sandy that Miss Brodie has really good taste so the implication, a violent response from this male figure is attractive, there's a sense here that they find what Teddy Lloyd has done attractive and it's excused with this kind of idea of an artistic temperament so the whole idea here is that those typical features of masculinity kind of heighten this attractive nature and it's the same with Dakin, remember. In The History Boys, yes, he is more fluid with his sexuality, but he retains those features of typical masculinity and therefore he retains that kind of attractiveness that Posner does not have. Um, and you get the kind of 
bit with Mr. Lowther that kind of goes alongside. He's a shy fellow. He smiled upon nearly everyone. Um, he won his own gentle way with nearly everyone. He, he said little and sang much. This is very different to kind of Teddy Lloyd in this anecdote, in the his gentleness is kind of placed alongside the kind of violence of um, the other figure. So, again, like I've said with other things, this is a kind of a starting point, something that you can kind of build on and go into kind of other bits. What you want to kind of think here, there's other bits with Gordon Lowther when he's actually in this relationship with... Brody that you might pick out, the way in which Brody kind of dominates, controls that relationship. There's an element of kind of coercive control within it. You might pick out other bits in terms of Teddy Lloyd or the kind of anecdotes within the classroom. This is just a kind of a limited snapshot to give you ideas of what you might do if you chose to focus a paragraph kind of pairing around um, the depictions of kind of masculinity in the text. Okay.